A few weeks ago, we ran the new trailer for The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild from the Game Awards through our analysis machine and found some pretty surprising things, so make sure to give that a watch if you haven't already. But that trailer wasn't the only glimpse at Zelda that the Game Awards provided, as Bill Trennan and Nate Bildorf took us on a 5 minute gameplay tour of a new part of the world that we haven't seen before. Yeah, you know what I'm getting at, it's finally time to analyze all of that too. So let's get right to it! And right away, we can tell this area is some kind of forest, albeit a more tropical one complete with palm trees. Even the temperature gauge is pointing to it being hot. And this area also appears to be windy, as we can see visible gusts blowing through, with the shrubbery even bending in the breeze. But did you notice that the wind actually switches directions? At first, it's blowing to the right, but a few seconds later, it starts coming right at the camera. It's a small touch that makes the world feel even more dynamic, and it might even factor into the gameplay too, such as maybe affecting which way a grass fire spreads. Okay, we'll have a lot more about this area soon, but for now, let's focus on the new bird character named Cass. And we can see that's his name before Bill and Ted, or Bill and Nate, even talk to him as we can see the highlighted character's name now appears over their head, which is something that wasn't present in the E3 build. Of course, this isn't the first bird character we've seen in Breath of the Wild, as we saw another in the Game Awards trailer, which we've already talked about a fair amount. But interestingly, they don't appear to be the same species, although it is possible they're just part of a larger bird family. And one of our fans, Shogoth8833, who's clearly much more of an avian expert than we are, points out that Cass appears to be based on the blue and gold macaw. And like with a real life bird, we can see that Cass is mostly blue with a gold colored front, although we can just barely see it underneath all the clothing he has on. And as it turns out, blue and gold macaws are not only intelligent, but is also capable of learning a relatively large vocabulary, which is fitting that, according to Bill and Nate, Cass is a minstrel, which Google defines as a musician that sings or recites lyric or heroic poetry to a musical accompaniment for the nobility. And true to his profession, we can both see and hear Cass playing an accordion even before approaching. And that accordion, by the way, even shares the same blue and gold color scheme of the blue and gold macaw. Oh, and if we zoom in close, we can see he carries around paper scrolls with music written on them as well. Anyways, once you talk to him, he'll ask if you want to hear the ancient verse that's been passed down through this region. And that verse is, Where the dragon's mouth meets a serpent's jaws. A shrine sleeps in the forest with noble cause. And in typical Zelda fashion, the keywords are highlighted, with dragon in blue and shrine in red. Now, it may just be a coincidence, but the shrine's red text aligns with the same color of shrines that are undiscovered in the world, much as the one that Cass refers to likely is. Curious! Also of note, Serpent isn't highlighted, suggesting it's of relatively low importance compared to the dragon, which seems to make sense given what we see later. Now, as he recites the lyrics, he also plays his accordion. His mouth meets the serpent's jaws. Shrine sleeps in the forest of normal cause. Okay, we got this. And the song that he plays? Yeah, that's a Breath of the Wild theme. And that's pretty interesting, as that suggests a song is meaning beyond just being the game's theme. Instead, it might have actual meaning and context within this world. And since minstrels recite lyrics for those of nobility, could that be a clue as to what the song relates to? Perhaps being representative of Hylian royalty or something similar? Maybe even Link himself? Also, I'm just gonna throw this out there, but Link's encountered quite a few characters during his adventures that have instruments, and more often than not, they teach him how to play a song. Take Guru Guru in Ocarina of Time, for instance, who you can hear playing the Song of Storms before he teaches it to Link himself. Now, of course, we've seen no signs of instruments for Link yet in Breath of the Wild, but could this maybe be a hint that he'll acquire one at some point? And perhaps learn how to play that very song on it? You never know. At any rate, Cass seems to be a pretty important character, or at the very least, a recurring one based on the fact that this isn't Link's first time meeting him, as Cass's We Meet Again makes clear. So it does seem that Link will be encountering him throughout the game, perhaps similar to the Owl from Ocarina of Time or Link's Awakening. Wait a second, what's the deal with all these helpful bird characters anyway? Regardless, it does seem that being a bird would come in handy as a traveling minstrel, allowing him to get to hard to reach places pretty easily. Now, unlike the owls, where you usually had no choice but to talk to them, it seems that Cass might be a bit easier to overlook and that you're not forced to talk to him at all, which might explain why he plays the accordion when idle, so that you can hear him from a distance and track him down. We can even hear evidence of this in the very next scene where they discover the serpent's head, because if you listen closely, you can still hear the accordion playing in the background. That's a serpent's head right there. Uh, good, good spotting, Nate. Um, it seems to be pointing this way, so I'm gonna head over here. Which means Link's still somewhat close. But how close? Well, we can see exactly how close, because when the camera pans up as Cass begins to sing, we can see the serpent's head right there. Okay, it can be a bit hard to see, so let's increase the contrast a bit. Yep, there it is. And you can see the same pillar right next to it too, so it seems that you'll be able to hear Cass's music from a pretty decent distance. And while we're on this shot, just left of the pillar by the serpent's head is a wooden tower topped with a horned skull and it seems to have three floors connected by a pair of staircases. Now this structure is of course similar to the Bacalbin Towers we've seen in the Plateau, 
but this one does appear to be a bit grander, with a much more menacing skull decoration. Now to get over to that tower, as well as the serpent's head, it looks like Link will have to use a bridge near Cass to cross over a small stream. At any rate, the serpent's head appears to mark the official boundary of the area known as the Zonai Ruins. But as those words appear on screen, we can see a saving icon beneath it too. Does this mean that the game saves whenever you leave one area and enter another? Or is it saving the fact that this is the first time Link has entered this area? Anyways, the next scene takes place somewhere presumably nearby, with Link climbing a hill and encountering an electrified Lizalfos. And we know it's a Lizalfos from their weapon description for the enhanced Lizal Spear that Link picks up later. Now, Lizalfos are nothing new in Zelda, but the ones here appear to have a few new tricks. Because, just a few moments before Link picks up that weapon, we can see he gets caught completely off guard by a couple of Lizalfos. But if you look close, you can see them both crouching there just moments before they spring to life. Yep, it seems these guys will now lay low and try to blend into the environment until Link gets close. And similarly, if we go back to Link's first encounter, we can see that the one here is also crouching at the very start before springing to life. And he's not alone, as there's two more nearby. However, they never actually awaken in the video, suggesting that Link has to get pretty close to trigger them. Which means that these Lizalfos really do seem to be geared toward ambushing Link in general, and won't be drawn out into the open by noise. With maybe one key exception, which we'll get to shortly. Now interestingly, both sets of Lizalfos that we've talked about so far don't appear to be identical. The latter group is equipped as spears, and have a brown camouflage-like texture ideal for blending into the darker environment, while the first group is more green and have twin-tipped spears. Oh, and it's only the green ones that are electrified too, which you can see by their glowing horn. Okay, yeah, maybe we should have led with that because that's a pretty big difference. You can see some electricity shoot out as soon as he's alerted, and right after, he deploys an electric field attack that seemingly forces Link to keep his distance. But thankfully, he seems to have a tell where he tosses his head just before he attacks with electricity, which gives Link a moment or two to back away. A few moments later, we can see him perform a jumping attack. And did you see that range? It's nuts! And when he lands it, it deals a massive 7 hearts worth of damage to Link. Ouch! For reference, that's over a third of Link's maxed out life meter in most games, being 20 hearts. So to repair the damage, Bill enters the inventory screen to eat some health restoring food. But that screen reveals some changes and additions made to this menu since we last saw it at E3. For instance, it now says inventory at the top of the screen instead of pouch. And it's now flanked by a couple of different options for additional screens that you can access with the shoulder buttons. The L button brings up an adventure log, which we're assuming is like a quest log to remind you of ongoing tasks or maybe recent accomplishments. Whereas the R button brings up system. And we'll be straight up, we have no idea what that refers to. Is it a setting screen maybe? Or is there some kind of new system mechanic that we don't know about yet? Now in case you were wondering if there were maybe even more options beyond those three, well the three dots right below the word inventory seem to indicate which screen you're on. Which means these three screens are probably it. Okay, now besides the screens, there's the inventory itself, which reveals all kinds of things we haven't seen before. For instance, did you notice how some of the items glow when Link first accesses the screen? It clearly indicates something, but what? Our guess is it might show new items you've acquired, or rather gotten more of since you last checked the screen. And one of those items happens to be a brand new lightning rod, which the game describes as magical and able to use electricity. Unfortunately, the picture-in-picture -picture box covers up the rest of the description, so we're not sure if it shoots electricity, as one might expect based on rods in most Zelda games, or if it draws lightning to it, you know, similar to how lightning rods work in real life. In either case, it seems some kind of gem is involved, but again, we can't see the full details here. At the very least, this shows that Los Alphos won't be the only ones to use electricity-based attacks. In fact, this is something we first caught wind of back at E3, as the description for Normal Jelly stated that, although it's unusable in its current gelatinous state, applying electricity may change its form, which is something that seems a lightning rod should be capable of. Okay, next up, on the material screen, we can see that carrots are collectible, which might be the same vegetable we noticed in the Village from the Game Awards trailer. Then, in the bottom right corner, we can see some kind of tentacle, complete with suckers. So it's probably from some kind of octopus-like creature. Octoroks, anyone? On the next screen, we can see some kind of pink balloon-looking thing in the top left corner. It almost looks like a stomach, or maybe some kind of organ. Although the spikes in the back might be a little bit weird for an internal body part. So maybe it's some kind of blowfish-like enemy instead, making that the mouth. We're not entirely sure. Next up, we can see several different kinds of symbols next to the items on the food screen, which indicate the effect that the food will have. Now some of them we have seen before, like the yellow hearts that indicate which food will temporarily extend your health meter. But what about the other icons? Like the electric bolt here, which we're guessing might make Link immune to electric attacks. That certainly would come in handy around these parts. And what about those two wavy purple lines? We're not entirely sure, but as it turns out, Bill does briefly select it on the menu, bringing up the description, which of course is mostly obscured. But what we can see is that it grants a high level of something. Yeah, the rest is cut off, but one of the words that is cut off starts with ST. So maybe that word is stat? 
Or it could be stamina too. Although, we have already seen the icon for food that restores stamina being a green circle. So who knows? Then there's a blue arrow, which we think could temporarily increase Link's speed. And finally, the orange sun, which we have a feeling might make Link more resistant to the heat. Especially since we've seen the cold resistance icon before, and it's a snowflake. Finally, we can see that Link's stamina meter looks a little different than before, now featuring an additional ring, or a portion of one anyway, on the outside. And we actually see it in use, confirming that it functions as additional stamina before the primary ring is used. Which means that, yeah, the stamina can be upgraded in this game. Now at first, the portion of the outer ring here looks roughly to be one-third of a circle, but it's actually slightly more, which suggests that you'll be upgrading your stamina meter in increments smaller than the portion shown here. Alright, and that's the end of our analysis halftime show, starring the inventory screen. So let's get back to the action on the field. The next scene shows Link reaching the ruins proper. And as it turns out, all of the scenes from here to the end of the gameplay video take place in the same area. Look, there's a dragon's mouth dead ahead, where Link will be ambushed by the Lizalfos. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. So we can see that the ancient ruins form walls that run along either side of this area, leading right up to the dragon's mouth. We can even see similar looking serpent heads that decorate the walls as the one that led Link here. There's also a small pond here with two bridges leading across it. And does that second one mean there could be a second entrance into this area? Or maybe it just leads to the ruined wall so Link can climb up it? At any rate, once Link enters the area, Elizalfos on the pillar dead ahead notices Link and appears to be the one that blows a horn, which alerts three more to Link's presence. One on the right, another on the left, and a third that's really easy to miss by the pillar right here. And based on the fact that he seems to jump up from a crouched position, it seems that he too, perhaps along with the others, were ready to ambush Link if they hadn't already been alerted to him by the horn. Anyways, it's a very Lizalfos by the pillar that Link attacks in the next clip, with another one of them making a cameo just behind him. And yet a third attacks Link from another nearby pillar. But he's using something we haven't seen before. Electrified arrows. And it's enough to take Link down for the count. So clearly approaching this area head on, so to speak, may not be the best idea. But here's something interesting. The game over text is usually written in red. But this time, it's yellow. Perhaps changing to match the color of the electricity that killed him? We actually saw something similar back during E3, where a death by drowning resulted in a blue colored game over. Which suggests that the color of the game over text changes to fit the circumstances of Link's death. It's neat, but a little morbid. So it's at this point that Bill hands a controller to Nate who tries a different approach through this area. This time by maintaining a lower profile by swimming toward the wall on the right, specifically right around here. And once he climbs his way to the top, we get a close-up look at one of the pillars. And we can see an image of what appears to be a serpent on it. There's its head, with its body snaking behind it. Yeah, it seems to be a bit of a theme here. So could there be more to that serpent than just being part of the ruins here? I don't know, like, maybe a boss or something? Anyways, from this ridge, Nate's able to stealthily take down a couple of the Zalfos. One with a headshot, then another from long range with his bow and arrow. But interestingly, Nate actually moved over to the ruins on the opposite side of this area for that second enemy, which we can tell by the fact that the dragon's head is right there. We then see him leap from the ledge, deploy the paraglider, before launching into a downward stab to take down another Lizalfos who's mostly none the wiser. Pretty brutal! With the area mostly cleared, Nate then drops to ground level to approach the dragon's mouth ahead. Now, in case there were any doubt that that's actually the dragon's mouth that Kaz referred to, we can see what appears to be its teeth right here. Now, as Link approaches the stairs, this is where he gets ambushed as we discussed earlier. But there's really not much more to say about the combat itself that we haven't already covered before. Except, we did know something interesting here. When Link picks up one of their spears, the game freezes like usual to show what it is on screen. Except, Nate's still able to control the camera even while frozen. So that might come in useful for figuring out your plan of attack while in the heat of the moment. Anyways, with the Lizalfos cleared out, there's still one more enemy to take on. And it's a big one, in the back of the dragon's mouth, who appears to be guarding something that's glowing. Now this isn't actually the first time we've seen an enemy of his kind, as two or three of them appeared back in the E3 trailer. Except back then, they were only found in the snowy mountain region and had purple skin. Whereas this is a more tropical environment, and his skin looks more brown to us. Although it could be a trick of the lighting. But assuming it's not, that could mean that their appearance changes depending on the region that they're found in. Now, after Link catches his attention, Nate tries to set a trap by rolling a bomb right toward the enemy. Except it doesn't work, as he simply walks around it. Which, while seemingly a small thing, really shows that the AI is a bit more advanced this time around than your typical Zelda game. Now, even though we never see him land an attack on Link, we think it's safe to say that these guys are probably pretty strong based on how big and slow they are. But it's that slow speed that seems to be their downfall, as it gives Link time to get behind them and attack. Also, did you notice Link actually knocks his weapon right out of his hands even before he's killed? That's pretty neat and should put the enemy at an even greater disadvantage. Okay, so with the big guy down, Link can finally approach a glowing thing in the back of the dragon's mouth that he appeared to be guarding. Except Nate and Bell refuse to go there. What teases? 
but that doesn't mean we can't tell what it is. Because if we zoom in, we can see it's pretty clearly a statue of the goddess, like the one found in the Temple of Time. And since it's glowing, it's probably interactive. Now if any of this sounds familiar to you, it's probably because we've already talked about a fair amount in our analysis of the Game Awards trailer. So make sure to give that a watch if you haven't already, as we explore some pretty interesting ideas related to it. Alright, so that pretty much covers it for everything about the playthrough itself. Except for one thing. Where in the world does this take place? After all, the thick forest makes it impossible to see any real landmarks. Except for this mountain right here, which we can see in a couple of different scenes. Now I've seen a few people suggest that it might be Death Mountain, but we're pretty sure it's not since there's no lava pouring down it. But unfortunately, we weren't able to match up that mountain with any of the others we've seen. So clearly, it's impossible to say where this scene takes place as there's nothing to connect it to. Or is there? Because, as it turns out, we actually do see palm trees in two other scenes from the E3 trailer, being this beach shot, as well as this canyon one. So could all three of these be taking place in the same general region? Maybe, but it still doesn't help narrow down where exactly this is, because we didn't know where exactly those scenes took place either. But there is something else that might offer a hint, although we admit it could be a stretch. Because that serpent head that Link finds in the Game Awards footage may not actually be the first time we've seen it. Because if we go all the way back to the original E3 2014 trailer when Link's being chased by a guardian through a forest, we can see some pretty similar looking statues here and here. And of course, it appears to take place in the forest too. And do you remember that bridge that Link gets chased across? It looks practically identical to the one near Cass, complete with a shallow body of water on both sides of it. And again, it's in a dense forest. So could that bridge by Cass be the same one that the Guardian chases Link across? Or even if it's not the exact same bridge, it could still take place in the same general area. Okay, now granted, the two scenes aren't identical, if only because there are no palm trees in the E3 footage. But do keep in mind that that trailer was from two and a half years ago, and we'd be very surprised if some things hadn't changed or been moved around since then. So if we assume it is in fact the same area, then we might be able to infer roughly where in the world that bridge and the ruins are located based on the opening scene of the E3 2014 trailer. Because we can see both Death Mountain way off in the distance, as well as the Twin Peaks. And based on the relative placement, with Death Mountain being to the right of the Twin Peaks, that would mean that this area would have to be from a region somewhere beyond the Twin Peaks, to the southeast. But there's just one problem. In the E3 2014 footage, the taller of the Twin Peaks appears to be on the right, whereas it should be on the left from this angle based on how we saw it from the plateau at the most recent E3, which would make this shot impossible to achieve in the current version of the game. So either they flipped the Twin Peaks around since E3 2014, or maybe the entire geography of the world has changed since then to some degree, whether big or small. But either way, it may or may not offer a hint as to where those scenes take place. Okay, we're just about done here, but there are a few final details I want to touch on. For one, at the Game Awards, Bill referred to the plateau as being just 1% of the entire world. Which is interesting considering they described that E3 as either being 2% of the world, or less than 2%. In either case, 2% was a benchmark and not 1%. Now, that's obviously only a difference of 1%, but in this case, that would potentially double the size of the world. So, why the change? I mean, there's no way they added that much to the game since E3. So, maybe it's just a more accurate figure. Or could it perhaps be a tease to something else? Maybe something that relates to our flashback idea from our previous analysis. After all, if those flashbacks end up being a thing, and if they end up being playable, that would technically double the size of the world. You know, since it's the same world, but in a different time. Okay, yeah, that's probably pretty unlikely, but you never know. Finally, we've talked about several potential connections to Twilight Princess before, such as the Great Bridge of Hylia, as well as what might be Castle Town from the latest trailer. And there might be one more and it's all based on the apparent emphasis on bird people in this game, which is something we haven't seen before outside of the Wind Waker timeline. With maybe one exception, because a couple of our fans, Eli and Jep, reminded us of something from Twilight Princess HD. Because if you take a close look at the wall behind the fountain in Castletown, you can see artwork that depicts what appear to be bird people. Now what's really interesting is that artwork doesn't exist in the original version of Twilight Princess, at least as far as we can tell, because it's a lot blurrier, meaning it was added just for the HD version which of course was released just a few months before Breath of the Wild was shown off at E3 2016. So could that be an intentional reference they added to the game as another connection to Breath of the Wild? Alright, and we're finally done covering everything we could dig up on Breath of the Wild. But like always, let us know if we missed anything by posting in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and for all of you Game Explain newbies out there, make sure to hit that subscribe button for tons more Breath of the Wild and other things gaming too. Catch you later, bye.